Hey everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Decoding Visitor Behaviors to Unlock Revenue Growth. My name is Riley McLaughlin, and I'm the content manager here at Main Street ROI. And I'm joined by Sean McCarthy, who is the director of brand and content at Lucky Orange. And um, before I pass it off to him to uh, actually present today's webinar, a um, couple quick housekeeping things. So um, first off, this webinar is being recorded. So um, what's going to happen is tomorrow morning you should you should get an email um, with two links. One is a link to the recording for this webinar, and um, the second link is going to be a copy of the slides. So you don't have to worry about you know writing a bunch of stuff down. Um, you'll get a copy of both the recording and the slides tomorrow morning. Um, also, this um, this webinar is going to take about an hour. If you have any questions, we're just going to take those during the webinar. So don't hold those to the end. If you have a question, please um, put it in the chat over on the right hand side of the screen. And um, also just know that if you have a question, chances are that someone else has that same question. So um, you're doing everyone a favor by asking it. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sean. Sounds good. Thanks, Riley. And good morning or afternoon or whatever time it is for you, wherever you're tuning in. Um, as Riley mentioned, I work for a company called Lucky Orange. And I'm not going to start this out with a sales pitch, but I think it is important to just mention what we do, which is website optimization tools. So think heat map session recordings, on-site surveys, and stuff like that. Basically, we help people who are trying to make money using a website. And that website could be e-commerce, it could be lead gen, uh, B2B, whatever it might be. And in my role specifically, I get the opportunity to engage with a wide variety of people from organizations that are trying to use a website to make money. And these could be founders, growth marketers, analysts, whatever they are. And the common thread in these conversations is that everybody loves data. And rightfully so, and especially in a time and day where data is so prized and we can get at so much information um, and we can really, really find um, quantitative data about anything. And what usually happens is that I'll get into a little bit of a deeper discussion with somebody and we'll start talking about trends with their data. I'll start saying, what's your churn rate been like? Or what's your average order value, um, your MRR, really any of these common metrics. And they will confidently say something like, oh yeah, I know where to find that information, or I have a number on the top of my head. Here's where we're at, here's where we're trending. And that's really, really awesome to be able to start there. But then I'll throw um, more questions at them and they'll again say, we're data driven. We'll pull up charts and we'll say, this is great. We make a lot of decisions based on data. Kind of the, the golden standard of uh, decision-making as a business person is to be able to back it with data. But then what will happen is that I will throw some questions to them. And this is from my perspective as kind of a CRO person and a behavioral analytics person. I'll say stuff like, what worries people about buying from you? Or how do people think your offer will improve their life? Or even something simple like, do people find your site to be usable? And that person oftentimes will turn into this guy. And he's not saying like, hey, how you doing? He's saying, I'm not so sure I know the answer to that question. Oftentimes they'll say, I think I know. So for example, I think I know that people might be scared about buying our product from us because we don't have that many reviews on our products or something like that. And that's a totally common sense and reasonable idea and reasonable reason why somebody might be worried about buying from you. And what we'll do is we'll go back to these charts and I'll say, okay, well, you see, and this is just a made up chart for conversion, right? We'll say, okay, what, what happened here? And the person who's sort of managing the situation will say, well, actually we had a meeting and we looked at this conversion rate trend, this dip in conversion rate, and somebody raised their hand in the meeting and said, yeah, that's actually about the time where we launched a new ad campaign. Or somebody raises their hand and says, oh, we, we added a new line of legal text but, uh, below our form. Or we had a technical issue that week, something like that. And then the person will say, okay, everybody go look and see, investigate deeper, come back to the table. And then again, we just get people saying, I think this, I think this, I think this, and we can try and find our way out of it. But what I'm here to talk about today is what we're not seeing in a chart in this quantitative data, which simply put is the people and our visitors. And I love stock photos. We'll see stock photos throughout a, a couple times here. Um, I love stock photos where people are expressing a lot of emotion and there's three here. So 
the range of expect the range of experiences on your website would be somebody's having a terrible time. They can't find what they need. They're having issues with checkout or they're on their phone trying to use your website and it's a terrible experience. All the way up to the person who's having a great time, smoothing, uh, sailing smoothly through checkout, or they're repeating visiting, they're repeating buying from you, and everything in between. So there's a wide range of visitor experiences that are happening that are driving the results that we see in the quantitative data. And so what I wanna start out with is by saying that I think that only using quantitative data to optimize a website is dangerous. And now dangerous might be a little bit over the top, but what I mean is that quantitative data is only providing us a part of the picture. It's not providing us insights into the actual user experience, it's providing us insights into the results of that user experience. And so what we'll walk through today are three principles of behavioral analytics. And as we go through these, what I hope to do is present you with a set of questions and a way of thinking about and considering your visitors from a qualitative perspective. It's really, really hard without seeing your exact website to be able to say, here's exactly what you need to do on your site. Here's the questions you need to be asking. But along the way, I hope to provide enough examples, and enough questions so you can start to think, hmm, I wonder if I asked this question about my website and about my visitors, what the answer would be. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, behavior is communication. And whenever I say this, to, to like my wife or somebody, she's like, I don't know what that means, that's, that's dumb. So let me make it just slightly more relatable. When I go to a restaurant and I order food, the waiter comes over, says, how's your food? If you're like me, you probably just say, yeah, everything's fine, thank you so much. But if that waiter walks away and he looks back over or she looks back over and you're kind of pushing something to the side, you're looking at it funky, you're cutting your meat saying, am I gonna get food poisoning from this? That behavior tells a very, very different story than what you said when you said, yeah, everything's fine, thank you so much. So what we're chasing today is figuring out how behaviors online equal certain communication, equal, or are we trying to figure out what they're communicating? We'll walk through three different categories here, and we're gonna use these three words to approach this, which is usability, worry, and motivation. So our first principle is that more people will buy from you if they can figure out how to use your site, which put more simply is more people will buy from you if they can buy from you. And this sounds really obvious, but this is where we have to start. We have to start by saying, is the site usable? Is it intuitive and is it easy to use? And really what that means is that we're talking about aligning with people's expectations when they arrive on our site. So most websites get traffic from a wide range of traffic sources, a wide range of different parts of the world maybe, different browsers, different device types, whatever it might be, you're getting a wide range of different people coming through to your site. Even if they are all part of your addressable market, they come to you with different expectations because their expectations are based on their personal experience. So if I shop on amazon.com, I experience something, I am used to using that sort of website to buy something to check out to use a certain payment method. If I'm used to evaluating B2B software on a website by going to feature pages, looking at a pricing page, whatever that is, that is my experience that turns into my expectations when I come to your site. And then those expectations for the team who is monitoring and optimizing the website translate into usability requirements. So if somebody is used to engaging with a site in a certain way, they may be conscious of this, they may not be conscious of this. When they come to your site, they have expectations of how it will perform, how it's usable. And so on our end, we have to consider what their expectations are and approach them as usability requirements. Now there's a couple of things to set this up that I think we would all agree with. And if we were in person together, I would probably say, raise your hands if you agree with this. And so there's a couple of things that are general expectations that we need to consider as usability requirements. The first one here, as you can see, 85% of adults think that a website when viewed on mobile should be as good or better than on desktop. So especially if you're in like e-commerce, you probably look at your analytics or quantitative data and say, yeah, the majority of our traffic is coming from mobile. And if that's you, you've probably focused on making your mobile website as good or better than on desktop. And so for many of us, this is a no duh, but this is a good example of people having expectations that turn into a usability requirement for us on the website. And another one that's 
you know, pretty broad, is that $2.6 billion, slow loading websites cost retailers $2.6 billion in lost sales each year. Again, I think we would all probably agree, a fast website is better than a slow website. And in fact, a slow website can cost us a lot of money in conversions. And obviously this depends if you're, again, industry, e-commerce, legion, whatever it is, we know that time uh, attention spans have gotten smaller and shorter. We know that our website has to load quickly or we will lose people. And so these two things are kind of how I wanna set this up and say, there's probably some stuff you already are thinking about as an expectation that turns into a usability requirement. But what else is there? Where else do we need to be looking for usability requirements? Well, at Lucky Orange, we have tens of thousands few hundred thousand people who have tried our tools over time, who have used our tools over time. And these are some common places where I tend to use usability issues. Now, these may apply to your website specifically, they may not. But again, hopefully this is a list of things to start saying, is our site search or navigation pagination, is our version of this optimized for usability? So site search is number one here. A lot of times what I'll see when we see issues with site search is that Somebody will open, let's say, a Shopify store and they'll see a plugin for site search or they'll see some sort of block to use a default thing for site search, but then the experience might be terrible. You click the button, it opens in a light box, you're searching and it displays results be below it. You click on a result, you get to what you, you, know, you clicked on, but then you wanna go back and there's no search results page because it was just in a light box, something like that. We can see a lot of issues with this. If you're gonna have site search on your website, we need to make sure that it's highly, highly usable because people come to our website expecting that to function as something that can get them to what they want quickly. Another example with product descriptions is that a lot of times we'll see product descriptions that are buried in collapsible dropdowns. Now, this is a great way uh, historically to say, look how much information we fit into a small space because you can collapse it and uncollapse it. Well, maybe people aren't clicking on that. So maybe that's not actually usable. Maybe the information that's in there that we think is important enough to put on the page is not getting seen by people because they're not clicking on it to drop it down. And so while that may not be a usability issue in so much as it's preventing them from finding that product and clicking out to cart and checking out, it is getting in the way of more conversions and an optimized user experience because the message that you think is most important about that might be buried there. And so a few others here, payment methods, as an example. Again, if you get traffic from all over the world, let's say, there might be a certain payment method or a certain way of paying, buy now, pay later sort of thing, from a certain part of your audience that they prefer. And if they come to your website and you don't offer that, that's an issue. And again, this may not be something that completely, completely prevents them from buying and checking out, but it might make them think twice about checking out if you don't have the payment method that they want. So let's look at a few uh, examples here and consider questions that we might ask to say, is this the most usable way, the most helpful way to display this information? So this is a Lucky Orange customer who sells these really, really awesome photography prints. And they're beautiful, different sizes, um, different you know, elements in the picture, some horses there. And the thing that drew my eye here when I was looking at this site was that his filtering mechanism is really, really specific. And so along the left side there that I've highlighted, you can see it's like five by seven and a half, 12 by 18. And if you think about how you buy art, maybe you have a space on the wall that's a specific size that you're trying to fill. Or maybe you're just looking for something that looks cool, that fits the, the style of the space. And so my question here that I would start with is saying, what's the best way to filter for that? Well, he's got his site search and he has, it, to be fair, in his prints drop down some, some categories of different types of images. But the specific filtering mechanism here is interesting because if I click on, let's say five by seven and a half inches, I get one result. And then if I wanna consider any other options, I can click on something else and I'm only gonna get one result or maybe two results at best. And so. What we need to consider is, is this the best way to filter? Does he need to have some sort of broader filtering set with sizes? Does he need to have some other thing on the page to filter by size that doesn't take up so much prime space when he needs to be displaying these images as large as he possibly can because they're beautiful and they should take up as much space as possible? Another example, and we'll talk about this one in a few different ways, but this is a coffee company, obviously, and they've got really, really solid product images, 
along the left side, you can see kind of a standard product page here and a cool graphic that shows the, the roast type. But what drew my eye here and what I want to kind of hone in on first is that they have a drop down. obviously a common way to display information, but here we've only got two options. In both the size and the grind dropdowns, there's only two options. And so my question here is, is this the best way on desktop and on mobile and on tablet to display this information? Now, when we look at quantitative data, we might say, here's how many people are coming to this page. We can say, here's how long they're spending on the page. We can say, how many people are clicking checkout. We know how many people are subscribing to save, how many people are just buying a one-time purchase. But what we don't know is, are they engaging with this dropdown? And if they are, is that increasing conversions? Is this the best way to do it? Or if we had a toggle or a radio button, how would we know what to do there? And we'll jump back to that in a second. This last example that I want to give before showing a couple tools to evaluate usability is something that I see happening a lot in e-commerce where people will assign category names to uh, different types of products. So here, these guys have decided that people that come to their website want to shop for t-shirts that have jets on them versus t-shirts that have warbirds on them. Now, these are different things, different types of planes. And so they've made a conscious decision to say, you want a shirt with a jet on it, you're going to click this. If you want a shirt with a warbird, you want to click on this. Not by color, not by long sleeve versus short sleeve or any other filtering mechanism. They've said, this is the most usable way to display this information for our visitors. And there's a couple of things that I would ask here. It's, do people know what warbirds are? Well, maybe. Do people know what jets are? Probably. But do they want to only look at those categories? And that's how we would say, is this the most usable way to organize these categories? Now, there's two tools that I want to start with. Both of these happen to be Lucky Orange tools, but again, not a sales pitch, because there are other versions of these tools out there. This one is a session recording. This is a screenshot of a session recording. A session recording is a complete playback of everything that a visitor did when they were on your site. So this is a static image here, but if we were watching the, watching the session recording back, we would see the user's mouse going all the way across the site. We'd see where they click, we'd see what they do, how far down the page they scroll. If they try and click on something and it doesn't work, if they click on a menu dropdown, if they engage with chat, if there's a pop-up and they do something with it, we can see every single thing that they do when they're on the site. So if we look at this one, this is like a, a fake denim website that we use for demos and stuff like that. Along the right hand side, what you see is a list of events. These are the things that they did on our website. We know the page they're on and you can see click, click, click. And then there's something called a rage click. And this is a good example to talk about for usability. It's something that we can find very easily within a session recording. In a rage click, you may have heard of that phrase before. We define it as clicking on something three or more times and nothing happens. So there's two things that could be happening when you see a rage click. One is that person clicked on that thing three or more times, nothing happened, and they thought it should be linked, obviously, but you on the website didn't think that that should be linked. So for example, a lot of times what I'll see is a better business bureau icon logo or some sort of carrier or brand logo. Let's say you're an insurance carrier logos. The person clicks on that, they think that it should be going to something you say, actually, we just put that there because we thought it looked nice or it helped compliment or it was a good message to share. The other, and so in that situation, excuse me, is that you would say, well, we're seeing a lot of people clicking on these. What would it go to? Do we need to say this goes to uh, another landing page? Does it need to have information that is below it that helps people understand why that's there? Or do we need to remove it if it's just being distracting? The other situation that happens with bridge clicks is that somebody clicks on this three or more times and nothing happens, and you thought that it was linked, but it's broken. And so this is a good way to spot on our page things that people are engaging with and see if they're clicking on it and some, nothing's happening. And if it's a broken link or you thought it was linked and it's never been linked, it's a good way to find those. And all, you know, all sorts of activities as they navigate the page. And so if we go back to our, our friends selling coffee here, what we can do with a session recording is watch people who are on this page. Are they clicking on that dropdown or are they not? And if they are, then what happens? And that's kind of one of my favorite things is like people will say, well, what am I looking for in a session recording? Which is a brilliant and difficult question to answer. But in this case, what I would say is, 
what happens when somebody clicks on that? What do they do after that? If I come here, I might look at this and say, okay, well, how much more does it cost for four pounds? So I'm gonna click to four pounds. And then I might click back to 12 and I might do some math really quickly and say, can I get a better deal if I buy 12 ounces worth times three or four to get up to four pounds, whatever it is, yada, yada, yada. With a session recording, we can see exactly what they're doing on this page. And so if you think about your website, your homepage, your product page, um, whatever it is, your sign up page for demo, something like that, depending on your industry, you can see everything everybody does, where they click, where they scroll, again, everything they do. The second tool to call out here is heat maps. And again, this may be something you've seen before. This may be a word you've heard before, heat maps. This is similar to session recordings in that it's a visual display of visitor behavior. But in this case, instead of looking at an individual's behavior, we're looking at an aggregated view of everybody who's visited this page. So this is kind of like the trend view. In this particular instance, again, we're looking at this uh, denim website. There's a lot of uh, activity. The darker red it is, the hotter it is, the more activity there is, is how a heat map works. There's a lot of activity around the top nav. That makes sense. There's a lot of activity around the CTA button in the middle of the page, so much so that you can almost not see it. Both of these make sense. What we're looking at here is a moves heat map. And so that's where the mouse is. This isn't actually clicks, this is moves. If we were looking at a click heat map, which is the second type of heat maps, it would probably look similar. In this case, we'd see where the clicks are. The moves lead to clicks, generally speaking, for something like nav and a button. We could also look at a scroll heat map, which is the other type of heat map. And that, that more simply shows how far down the page people are scrolling. But here, what I would look at, let's say we are trying to improve the amount of people or increase the amount of people who use our site search because we know more people using site search means more people finding something they need, means more people getting closer to adding to cart to checking out and making us money. And what we see here is there's some mouse movement to search. There's not a lot. And what I might say is, oh, we saw in the heat map, here's what's happening. People are focusing on the nav and people are focusing on that main CTA button, but they're not really finding search. So what can we do? Okay, we could increase the search icon. We could add a search field that's already there to make it bigger or bolder. We can move it closer to search. Whatever it might be, if that's my initiative is to get more attention there, now I have the data to say, here's where people's attention is on this page and how far it is away from the site search, let's say. So if we go back to our friends selling coffee, what I might do on this page is use, first of all, a scroll heat map. When I'm considering buying coffee online, it's a very physical experience, usually buying coffee in person. You smell it, you look at it, you touch the bag. I can't do that here. So down on this page, they probably have a bunch of product description information. Are people getting down there? Are people seeing it? I might also look again at a click heat map and say, how are people engaging with these drop downs? How are people engaging with the quantity? Maybe even with this roast um, darkness thing, are people clicking on that? Do they think they can drag it and do something like that? Are people clicking on our ratings to go look at reviews? Armed with session recordings and heat maps, we can say, here's how real people are using this site and go beyond time on page, go beyond bounce rate, conversion rate, things like that. And you might be thinking, okay, cool, but I get hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, if you're lucky, of visitors to my site every week. Now, if you are listening to this and you already know about session recordings and you are watching hundreds or thousands of session recordings a week, please reach out and let me know because it's kind of insane, but also awesome. You're probably not. So the, the easiest way to focus this and make it what I like to say surgical is by using segmentation. And so just like anything we do with marketing, just like anything we do with business, we gotta focus on certain segments, certain groups of our audience. And I've highlighted UTMs with a little green star here, not a gold star, green star, is to say this is a great place to start because you may already be using UTMs to tag things like campaigns. And so if you're running Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads, you wanna get the highest possible performance you can out of those. What we can do is go into session recordings or heat maps and say, I only wanna see how people that came from UTM campaign equals spring sale are performing on this page. I only wanna see the data, the qualitative data of people 
on this page from a certain campaign or from a certain channel or as is listed out here, a certain device type. We can also combine these to say, I wanna see people from a mobile phone from Germany who came from this Facebook ad campaign. And this can get super duper granular if we want it to, or it could be as displayed on the right side here. Let's see first time visitors. Let's see people who are frustrated. Let's see people who are currently online. Or you can even go so far as to use custom user data, which would be passing in something like, are they a member, if you have a membership, or whatever you want to pass in. Okay, so we're talking about usability, making sure that people can use our site, and I want to jump into worries, which takes us to our second principle of behavioral analytics, which is that more people will buy from you if you manage their worries. Now, worries here should represent anxieties and concerns and worries, things that they worry about when they're considering buying from you. And there's two categories really of worries. Now people worry about buying your product or service, period. People also worry about buying your product or your service from your brand, your company. Now in that first category of what people worry about with your product or service, it's stuff like quality or production methods, or if it's clothing, it's fit. As hard as I try to look like a supermodel that could be wearing clothing, clothing like they do on the website, I'm not. It doesn't fit me the same. So I'm concerned about that if I'm buying something online. Now, of course, free returns and stuff like that makes that a lot easier, and that's how they're overcoming my worry, but that's something I might worry about. If I care about environmental impact, I want to make sure I understand that. Of course, that only applies to certain products, so I'm not telling everybody who has a website, go on there and make sure you communicate about environmental impact. But if you know your, audit, your audience cares about that, we need to prioritize that. And something like ingredient clarity. So let's say you sell food, products. An instance I ran into recently was that somebody discovered that there is a big difference between describing their product as non-dairy versus something that doesn't contain milk. And so people worry about, hey, does it have milk? Or actually don't really care if it just doesn't have milk. I need it to completely have no dairy in it. So we need to really, really understand what people worry about with regards to our product or service to be able to properly communicate and prioritize things in our website experience. And the second category, what I said, people worry about your brand, your company. Now, again, like I let off with, people worry about, are there enough reviews of this for me to be confident in? If it's something that can be certified, is it certified? And if it's certified, and if you're saying it's certified, are those certifications real and meaningful? Oftentimes, we'll also see some competitor FOMO, fear of missing out. So am I buying the right product from the right brand? And I'll see this manifest in something like Reddit, which is a dark, dangerous place. But I'll go on there and I'll see, hey, I found these sunglasses online, great price, they look cool. The product photos are cool. It's an interesting thing, but I've never heard of this brand. Does anybody have any experience? And you'll see a bunch of comments that say, yeah, 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 I hate it. I did this. Oh, actually, those are great. Those are sick. Or those are actually made in the same factory as Ray-Ban, but they just don't have the logo on them, something like that. We see a lot of worry about, am I buying this product from the right brand? Am I going to buy this and be supported by their customer support team? At Lucky Orange, we experience this a lot. We know that using a SaaS tool oftentimes, require, oftentimes requires interacting with a support team, whether it's for billing, admin, and support like that, or it's just using the darn tools. So people worry, are they gonna be supported by you? And then a few more things. They worry about billing security, security in general, or privacy of information, depending on how they interact with your website. Now, just like we did with usability, I wanna set the scene and say, we all kind of understand how some of this works already with our gut. 75% of consumers admit to making judgments of a company's credibility based on the company's website design. So even before we get to saying, is it non-dairy versus does it not have milk, does the site just look legit? Does it feel legit? And so what we have to do is say, let's start there. Let's raise our level of taste, in air quotes, and make sure that people really, really understand that this is a legit company that's safe to do business with. And then we can progress to the more specific and granular elements. Let's look at a couple of examples. So this is, again, a Lucky Orange customer. 
and they happen to sell uh, handmade bespoke suits online. They're made in London, they look pretty cool, but buying a suit online is a pretty interesting experience. It's a high ticket item. You don't buy that many suits, likely. Um, you might wonder again, how does this fit on me? And when I come here, I say, I do have questions. I'm curious to learn more about this. And what they've done is they provided a lot of information, but it's all in these drop downs. We've got a description, we've got a product description, we've got why made to order, shipping, info and care, yada, yada, yada. And I'm sure it's all great, but I have to click into those and open those and read those. And so what I would do as somebody optimizing the site is go back to a session recording and I would watch people engage with this page. If most people are engaging with why made to order, then that's what people are worried about when they come to this page. And we need to prioritize that by either pulling it out of the dropdown, maybe making a video, which this brand happens to have, just not on this page, or using some sort of product image that talks about why made to order. So what we can do is seek that qualitative data to say, which out of this information are people engaging with? What do they care about most? And this is a cool e-bike with a sidecar. I would love to have one of these. And my 16-year-old inner self immediately says, well, how fast is it? Can I do, you know, burnouts? Of course not. It's an e-bike. But what I see is that it says 750 watt hub motor. Okay, well, I don't know what that means. And maybe some of their audience does, but what we need to figure out if we're this brand is, do people care about how fast it is? Of course, they want to know if it's safe. They want to know how it steers and it does look awesome, but how fast is it? And if I care about that, I imagine other people care about that. That's something that I'm interested in knowing more about and something that would probably prevent me from initially clicking add to cart. I might go out on social media and say, hey, does this e-bike with a sidecar, how fast is it? We could talk about that there. Another example is that within uh, furniture, furniture prices are insane if you've bought anything in the past few years, but this is a table, it's $4,500. The interesting thing on this example is that they have a CTA button that says start a conversation about your table. And then below that is the small language that says add to bag. Add to bag is the direct way of buying this product. And interestingly, when I click start a conversation about your table, what happens is that we get a pop-up and the pop-up says, what do you like about this table? What would you change? What, excuse me, what would you like to change on this table? And they've now introduced worries that I didn't have before I landed on this page. Should I want to change something about this table? I, I just like it. It looks cool. I think it'll fit my space. That's what I like about this table. Do I need to start a conversation or can I just add to bag? And so sometimes we just need to communicate things in the proper order and not volunteer new worries for people and get in the way of a conversion like this one might do. So throughout our organizations, there's probably already worry data flowing around. A good example of that is customer support channels and customer service channels. So obviously customer service gets a lot of questions. They get a lot of concerns and issues and that can manifest and help us as worry data. So if people are saying, look, I bought this thing, but I don't know how to install it, or I can't figure out how to use it in this way, or it's got some wear and tear quickly after I bought it. That's all stuff that we can use qualitatively to say, okay, well, that means we need to provide better education through an email. That means we need to provide better education on the site to say, actually, it's easy to set up, here's how you do it. Again, like I mentioned with the suits, we can also use sessions and heat maps to figure out what people are engaging with most on the page. And another one that's kind of one of my favorites is to use an on-site survey. Now we're not talking about multi-question lengthy interview style surveys. We're just talking about one question. So I might say, what do you care about most when it comes to buying a suit, period, or question mark, leave it open. Sean, are you still there? I think we lost audio for a sec. What are you looking to achieve today? We can also look at social media, like I said, Reddit. 
We can look at online reviews and say, hey, people are commenting that they're concerned about this or that they bought from a competitor and it wasn't great. And we can say, okay, well, what are the competitors doing on their website? How are they getting out in front of worry data? How are they prioritizing their information to say, this is actually what you should care about. Here's how we're educating you to use this. We know that you care about this particular piece of information. And so we're describing it on our page. That can be a good place to go as well. Shifting into motivation. So whereas with worries, we're trying to overcome their objections, but on a website, we don't get to you know, say, hold on a second, let me help you person to person. We have to overcome those objections before they happen with our website experience and our messaging. With motivations, we're trying to get in line with them. And we're trying to say, whatever brought you here, whatever you're excited about, we can do that. And more people will buy from you if you align with their motivations. If you say, yep, you're in the right spot. We know you care about this part of our product or our service, and we can do that 10 times over better than anybody else. And the best way that I know to get at what people care about, what motivates them, is through a customer interview. Now, as I talk through this section, you might start to say, okay, well, worries, motivations, they kind of cross over. Sometimes, what is a worry? What's a motivation? Yada, yada, yada. And that's okay and totally understandable because these things do come from the human perspective. And it's a complex thing. And anxieties and motivations can sometimes cross over. And so I like to break them out to communicate them in these different ways. But really in practice, we're kind of leveraging anxieties and worries uh, and motivations at the same time because we're talking about optimizing for people. Now, let's run through a few questions that I find to be successful. Uh, again, it depends on your industry, which ones will work best. But it's things like, if you were in charge of our product, what would you change? And so they were motivated enough to buy the product. But even given that, once they have it in their hands, is there something that you would change? And what that can do is help us optimize for the people that are motivated for this thing. They say, yeah, it's great, but you know what would make me even more excited is if it had this feature or if your service offered this or if your nonprofit, after I donated, if you guys did this. Similar things here. Did you encounter any issues learning to use our product? So they were excited to buy it, but was there a, a barrier to starting to use it after purchase? Is there something that we need to do better on the front end to align with expectations and educate to say, once you do this, once you buy from us, here's the next step of learning to use it. Or what would make you stop using our product? If it's, if it's a service, okay, well, it's probably like I'm not getting value out of it. We can ask specifically, okay, well, what would make you stop using our product? How would you describe our product to someone who hasn't heard of it? I love this question because what it does is it says, our messaging resonated with you. Our way of describing and, and putting our product or our service in front of you made enough sense to you that you bought it. But when you go turn around and tell somebody else about it, what words are you using? And that can really, really help inform, look, people are motivated by this because they're saying, yeah, this fits my specific need of A, B, and C, but it also does D. And that's something that we can add on once we learn that that's how people describe our product. And again, what other options did you consider before buying our product? When it comes to something like B2B positioning, B2B SaaS positioning specifically in my world, what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, yeah, we have direct competitors that also offer session recordings and heat maps, but there's also the category of alternative solutions. So in, in my specific instance, we're also competing against A-B testing tools. We're not an A-B testing tool, but some people will say, I don't need a CRO tool. I don't need heat maps and session recordings. I just want to go straight to testing. Now I have clear arguments against that, but the only way that I can know that we're positioning against A-B testing tools in addition to CRO tools is because we've talked to customers about it. We've said, what does your shopping experience look like? Is there anything for us? Is there anything that frustrates you about using our product similar to that like initial learning issue where you bought it, you were motivated enough to do it, but there's something that's frustrating that can help us refine either the product or service, or it can help us set better expectations. Because if they said, you know, I really expected it to do this. It's fine, it's cool, I'm still gonna keep using it, but I thought that I was gonna be able to do this thing, and that's frustrating for me. Well, maybe we need to realign expectations all the way back through the website, or ad creative, or whatever it might be. And then the final sort of thing here, and I do this kind of like as a manager too, I'll say, why, or why not? And it can get 
annoying for employees, but that's okay. But for a customer interview, if they're willing to jump on here, they're willing to talk to you, asking, okay, well, why or why not, might get below that surface level answer and get you an even better response. Now, the question often comes up, or the pushback often comes up, like this is hard to get people on the phone because I'm talking about getting people on the phone, I'm getting, talking about having a conversation with customers. So there's a couple of tips that I usually give to teams who say, we wanna do more customer interviews. The first is to really focus on post-purchase, the post-purchase audience. And the reason is, is that because people buy from you for a very specific and likely small set of reasons. They say, yeah, you aligned with what I needed. This is exactly what I wanted. I purchased it. But on the flip side, people don't buy from you for a whole host of reasons that have nothing to do with your product or your website. They were shopping, they're on your website, and their kids started crying, so they left. Their phone died. They got in an elevator. They got a text message. All the stuff that could have taken them away from potentially buying from you has nothing to do with your website. It has to do with the general user experience. Now, we could argue that if we catch their attention fast enough, we can overcome stuff like that. They'll come back to us. But it's also harder just to get the information to connect with somebody who doesn't buy from us. So I'd focus on post-purchase. I would also focus on making it <coughs> automated because this is a numbers game. We have to send out an automated uh, email usually to people and say, look, we're trying to talk to some customers. Would you be willing to help us out? Make it automated so that you can play the numbers game and get as many responses as you can. And speaking of getting more responses, I like to incentivize these. Obviously, there's a profitability question that happens where we say, we can't incentivize the crap out of it to where our LTV shrinks like crazy. But realistically, we're not talking about hundreds or thousands of customer interviews. If we're lucky, we're talking about you know, depending on your business size, 10 a month, even five a month can be extremely valuable. And if you have more bandwidth or a bigger team, we can shoot for a bigger number than that. But incentivizing, automating, and focusing on post-purchase is a great way to get more customer interviews because I do know that it's hard. But every single time you talk to a customer, it's extremely valuable. And what we're looking for here, I won't spend too much time here because we've kind of sat on this for a little bit, but we're looking for unmet needs. We're looking for misalignment of expectations with what they got out of it. We're looking to say, is there something that you were, uh, you had post-purchase remorse about after you bought it? Because you thought that it was higher quality than it is. You thought that you could do something with it that you can't. We can also look for new markets where we say, oh, people actually think that our tool should be able to also do this sort of thing. People think that Lucky Warren should be able to do better with A-B testing. Okay, cool, let's consider we know that people are motivated by being able to analyze qualitative data of A-B tests. Maybe that's something that we can roll into our product. Or support enhancements. If we know what motivates people, also if we know what worries people, we can improve our support capabilities. A couple of examples to talk through about motivation. Now we're in a digital setting here, but if I were talking about this in person, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you smoke weed, and then I would say, don't do that because you'll get a random drug test, even though states are legalizing it. So this is a THC seltzer. This is one of the hottest product categories right now. If you click on an Instagram ad for a THC seltzer, you're gonna be getting dozens of those within the span of a day. But this particular one, they've done a great job of saying, we know that the majority of our audience is coming to a THC seltzer because they're trying to drink less or stop drinking. So they are motivated to ditch the booze, but not the buzz. They want to go to a party and have something in their hand, but they don't want to drink. And what's interesting to me here is that this is not 100% of their audience. It may be 80% of their audience, but they've said, we know this is the core motivation of using our product, and so we're going to highlight it and promote it on our homepage. But here's an example where this might go too far, because what we can do is say, we are going to focus on motivations. We're going to overcome worries but we can't forget to talk about what our product is. So if we read this, connect directly with your customers. Cool, I love that. Gain new insights and convert one-time buyers into loyal customers. Of course, sure. Capture first-party data, foster trust, drive consumer action. All these things, yes, let's do it. But what do you do? How do you do that? How do you help me? And this turns out to just be a QR code software. And it's great. They've got a great design, a good looking page, solid colors and fonts. What we lose in here is what the product is. And so what's gonna get me to click try for free or book a demo? If I clicked on an ad about QR codes and I come here, I might get lost and say, well, what, 
what the heck is this thing? And this example is a knee massage thing, and it looks kind of cool, kind of space age. But if I have knee pain, I'm willing to try just about anything to fix it because it's a day-to-day -day problem. And so immediately at the top of the page, they say results in as little as 15 minutes. Okay, well, that's totally doable. If I walk around with knee pain every day, that's doable. They've also provided some patent pending, best massager 2022, back to the certifications thing. And then later on down the page, what we do is we say, well, how does it work? Because if I have knee pain, I've probably looked at a variety of different options. What is this thing that I'm putting over my knee? I've never seen this before. How does it work? They come through with language about red light therapy, heat therapy, yada, yada, yada. And then later on down the page, they hit again only 15 minutes per day. And not only that, you can wear this thing and pet your dog, which is, you know, the life. Then they bring in a secondary point that they know people care about, which is to say, if you've got knee issues and you've been doing physical therapy, it's super expensive. Or if you've thought about the physical therapy, you might be on our page saying, is there a better option? Is there a less expensive option? And this is $89. It's not $10,000. Why would I not buy it? And of course, they say add to carts. I'm going to correct that and say we need to add to cart. But it's a really interesting example to say, how do we hit this on a product page? How do we overcome these worries and align with motivations in a product page? Now, we focused a lot on the website, but in kind of heading towards wrapping up here, what I want to say is this can actually improve the entire business. So if you're thinking this sounds like a lot of work, it can be, but again, it's worth it. And here's how I see this playing out. So this is just a two by two matrix, motivation, worry, low to high, left to right, a motivation, down to up, low, uh, a worry to high worry. And this is kind of see where I see these channels oftentimes falling. And so how do we use motivation and worry data to improve different parts of the business? Well, let's say I'm responsible for paid advertising. It's a really important part of the business. It's a place where we seek efficiency and optimization all the time. And so if I know what motivates people and what worries people, what can I do? Well, I can push to lower the amount of worry that people have. If I know that it's a trust thing and I'm using our paid ads, maybe I focus ad creative on a trust point. Or maybe I say I can increase motivation. If I know what people really care about, what part of our product they really care about, I can prioritize that in my paid ads, or I can prioritize that in aligning that on the landing page where they go, whatever it might be. Armed with this data, we're taking that quantitative chart that we saw at the beginning and saying, okay, well, not only do we know that the conversion rate is down, we know that people are more worried about this part of our service than ever before. Let's focus on that. And the only way we know that is through what we've been talking about today. Now, again, depending on the size of your organization, we'll, we'll determine how this plays out. But the number one most important thing is to have a centralized place to collect and analyze this information and then communicate it back out. And a few different places where I see this playing out and benefiting teams and businesses, something like a sales script. Like obviously if you have a sales script, you're probably refining it over and over again and tweaking it. And this sort of information can really help that process. But we can also do stuff like uh, road mapping and planning partnerships and integrations. So I've got a great teammate here at Lucky Orange who manages partnerships and integrations. And what she uses this type of data for is to say, People are worried that they just subscribe to Lucky Orange. They've got all this data that's just sitting here, but they want to use it elsewhere. Or they wish that it would be more usable for their organization by being paired with their um, CRM, whatever it might be. So we can look at that and we can say, okay, well, maybe we need to argue to get an engineer for three months to build out a new integration. And the only way that we can say, yeah, we think that we need to build this integration. We're very confident that people use it is if we know that that's going to hit a motivation or lessen a worry, whatever it is. Ad board, or excuse me, ad creative, onboarding, back to the, the part about like post-purchase remorse. We can improve our emails around onboarding, our onboarding process, a follow-up call if we're a, a SaaS tool or something like that. And so this can be used broadly speaking across the entire organization, in my opinion, to improve everything over time. And you still might be saying, can I make sure that my boss, how can I make sure that my boss cares about this? And that's an important question. If you are the boss, how can I talk to other leadership? And it's really just to drive the point home, this chart, this isn't scientific, 
but this is kind of my firm belief that I think time spent studying visitor behavior has an outsized and exponential impact on the business over time. And the reason is that every time we get a customer interview, every time we watch a session recording that's segmented or look at a heat map, that understanding of information, if we're collecting it and keeping it at the right place, doesn't go anywhere and it compounds on itself over time. And then what we get to is an organization that understands its customers better than it ever possibly could have. And you can make better, more efficient, more effective decisions. And a lot of times what will happen, this is my last slide, is I get people that will say, okay, great. What about my B2B site? What about my nonprofit site? What about whatever? The best way for us to talk about that is for you to send me your website to let me know hey here's my url here's my domain name whatever it might be and this is a qr code that should be going to my linkedin if it's not just search for me feel free to reach out feel free to send me your website we can say okay well here's what i think people might be worrying about here's what i think you should investigate and hopefully learn more about people and improve usability overcome worries and align with their motivations so i really appreciate you showing up thank you for your time and i hope this has been uh, helpful all right thanks so much sean yeah and uh it looks like we do have some questions so um let's see the first question is how do i tell what i need to improve with my website so kind of like a, in general if, if i'm you know, looking at my website i'm kind of not sure where to start how do i tell where to start i'll i'll hate i'll provide the answer that everybody hates which is it depends but i think we've got to start with usability like I said, if that's not figured out, if your site isn't usable and people can't find what they need, they can't use site search, your navigation's clunky, it's loading slow, images look funky, people have a bad first impression of it because you've got a bunch of different fonts or you know pixelated images, that sort of first impression and usability thing is where I would absolutely start to say, this is how we can attack this um, from step one before we even consider things like, um, honing in messaging to align with motivations or doing customer interviews. I think that it really has to be leveling up the usability. And, you know, we can just sit here and say, level up your usability, make it more usable. The best way to do this is to look at the industry leaders in your space and say, how are they organizing their website? You know, B2B SaaS, for example, like everybody's got feature pages. Okay, well, what are they doing on their feature pages? What does their checkout page look like? What does their pricing page look like? How are people ingesting this information in websites that are like ours? And is there something that I'm not doing that would be more helpful for people? Cool. Um, all right, next question is, what's the best approach to get a customer to respond to a short survey when they receive a post-purchase email? Yeah, I, I, I do think that, again, it's a numbers game. Um, a well-written, concise, short conversational email is more likely to get a response than something that feels like a marketing email. So if throughout your purchase email drip, you've got stuff that's super branded and professional looking and, con and transactional, because it's about the checkout, maybe consider doing this email as one that looks like it's coming directly from an individual's email account. That can be something to kind of slide in there. Uh, test subject lines um, make them again quick conversational hey i've got a quick question for you um, i'd love to hear what you think about the product that sort of thing and then if you can incentivize because that makes a huge difference and that's just sort of an unfortunate truth uh, for a lot of brands seeking to get more reviews or more more customer interviews as you may just have to incentivize and it's not a hundred two hundred dollars unless you've got a high uh, ticket item it could be 20 bucks 25 bucks amazon gift card something like that um, and you can really potentially increase that that likelihood that they'll respond. Cool, it's a great suggestion. Um, all right, what would be scenarios where Lucky Orange is not able to record a visitor's session on a website? Mm. So this, as you might imagine, changes all the time because how people build websites change. So historically things like iframes have been really difficult for lucky orange to track just by way of technology and i'm not a developer but we've made strides recently in being able to track with iframes you'd still be able to see the whole page you just may not be able to see let's say if you have an embedded video in an iframe you may not be able to see the click on there 
but you could see them hovering around it, which would indicate they're likely watching it. There's some, also some instances where things like Shopify protects their checkout page, where we can know that a checkout event has started, but we can't record the visitor on there. And part of that's because unless you're Shopify Plus, you don't actually have access to edit that page anyway. But there's some technical limitations like that. Um, there's some ad blocker things that pop up every now and then. I think we have help docs around this as well. So if um, whoever asked that question wants to follow up, I can track down some help docs there. Generally speaking though, we can track just about anybody anywhere. Um, and all you have to do is place a short code snippet in the header of your website um, to be able to track people. Perfect. All right, we have another question. How can we test why people bounce after a few seconds without doing anything on the site? Yeah, um, you'd be able to watch session recordings filtered by those people, so that's where I'd start. And of course it could be bots, right? We have to rule out bots and if it's bots, then we can go say, okay, session recordings can actually be helpful there because there is no, there's potentially no session recording that actually happens. Um, but if we are getting traffic that is bouncing that quickly, I would first try and figure out what traffic sources are coming from. If it's a variety of session, if it's a variety of traffic sources, then we can look and watch sessions for all of them. And I would say, what are they doing on the site before they leave? If it's only a few seconds, are they, you know, are they scrolling down the page real quickly, scrolling back up and just deciding it's not for them? Or are they clicking on something and it doesn't work? Or are they clicking on something and on accident, it's taking them away from the site. So we would just have to watch those sessions and see what's happening there. A lot of times, the, I think the most common thing that I see when it's like a few seconds is that whatever your ad creative is, is just out of completely out of alignment with what's in the landing page and people say, eh, this isn't what I thought it was. And so they bounce. And so again, it just depends, but the session recording can be really enlightening when it comes to seeing, okay, well, what are they doing during that really, really short amount of time? Great. And speaking of session recordings, there's a question about how to make this easier. So what's the easiest way to look through session recordings to make it useful for your time, but not have to watch every session? It sounds yeah. like you said those are grouped together, right? So you yeah. wouldn't have to watch each one individually. So this, this is the challenge for us as the product team at Lucky Orange is saying, how do we make this easier for people? And I will kind of make a promise that I've been making recently, which is we're working on it to make it easier. But for now, Segmentation is key. We do have a tool inside Lucky Orange that's called Discovery. And what it is, in short, is a, is a group of optimization opportunities, which is to say, show me sessions of people who were on my site and were frustrated. Show me what they did. And, th and stuff like that. Show me people who completed checkout. And so in that way, you click that and you click Discover and it takes you to a pre-filtered list of visitors. You can say, okay, these people are high, um, these are important sessions for me to be watching because they fit this criteria. So there, there's, outside of that, there's really a kind of a two-part thing that I would suggest that optimization of a website can happen proactively or reactively. And reactively would be my customer support team is coming to me and saying that people are commenting that they're having an issue checking out, right? a big issue. Okay, well, then I can go in and use these tools to evaluate what might be happening there. So I'm reacting to something that's happening in the business, or I see that our Facebook ad campaign isn't converting as well. Okay, well then I'm gonna go into session recordings, I'm gonna watch sessions from Facebook ads, which could be hundreds or thousands, and so we might wanna filter there again by people who bounced quickly, right, to the previous question. And the other side would be proactive optimization, which is the more difficult one, which is going into these tools and saying, I wanna find something that I can optimize. I wanna find an opportunity. Discovery can help get you in the right path there, um, but really what we're lo looking for is ideas for things that we can optimize. And I, I think that discovery is an important thing, <laughs> really, it's kind of like where everything is heading, is making this easier to get high value sessions in front of you. Um, but the real honest, candid truth is that you have to bring your ideas into the platform to say, I think I have a hypothesis or I think that I'm reacting to something and that's where I want to start my investigation. When people just get started with this, and this is probably the last part of this, is that just watching people navigate your website and try and shop can kind of deliver aha moments. Oh my God, why aren't they clicking on that thing? 
And sometimes when we first get people on the platform, they'll say, oh, wow, like people are so dumb when they're on our website. Well, no, maybe maybe your website just needs to be different. Maybe they're not catching what you're trying to, to deliver to them. Um, it is not easy is what kind of the, the headline message is, but we're trying to do things like the optimization opportunities to surface that. Um, but I would view these tools as a supplement to optimizing different parts of the business that use the website, like paid ads, for example. Okay, great. So it looks like we are out of time. So um, for everyone that asked questions that we did not get to, <clears throat> just know that we are gonna follow up with you via email. So we'll make sure that we get all of your questions answered. Um, also to recap, this webinar was recorded. So uh, what's gonna happen is tomorrow morning, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording for this webinar, as well as a link to the slides, which you can download. Um, and uh, with that, I wanna thank everyone for attending. And thank you so much, Sean, for this awesome presentation. Yeah, thanks for having me, Riley. And thanks for everybody for sticking around and um, happy to answer any other questions. Reach out to me. Um, I'm also McCarthy at luckyorange.com if anybody prefers email. Perfect. All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending, and um, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.